So the title of my talk is Brachytherapy, the Royal Flush of Radiation Treatment for Men with High-Risk Prostate Cancer. So I have no disclosures for this talk, but I will say Leonardo da Vinci apparently said that the greatest deception men suffer is from their own opinions, so I can disclose that, and I'm sure many of you in the room will kind of relate to that. So why is brachytherapy a role flush for or radiation treatments for high-risk prostate cancer? So these are the reasons. We have excellent long-term outcomes. We use less ADT. We cause less downstream toxicity, and we actually are very cost-effective. So you're all aware that NCCN guidelines for 2021, as well as ASCO and CCO guidelines, do recommend brachytherapy be used for men with all risk stratification prostate cancer. In particular for high risk, the boost should be used. And then there is a whole issue now in brachytherapy about how can we drive accountable care with brachytherapy. So something actually really went very wrong here. So what is wrong? Well, the wrong is that uh, utilization of brachytherapy has gone significantly down, but that is in the US. And so why is that? Well, we do, we do need specialized skills. The SBRT has kind of moved into the territory. Some people think brachytherapy is more toxic than external beam radiation. And then there's a lot of men who are getting active surveillance now. There's robots and there's also the payment methods. So I'm just gonna show you this slide from Nature published in October 2019. So if you do brachytherapy in the United States, you take home $400 for one procedure. If you do MRT, you take $4,200. So that all kind of tells me like, if in doubt, you should follow the money trail. So US does have prof pro profit medicine. And so that kind of difference from what Europeans may do or what we do in Canada. So this is the state of art now uh, in Canada, for example, Ontario 2020 has published a beautiful article and they look at um, men with localized prostate cancer and boost has increased per year by 24 percent monotherapy only by three percent because thanks to lori a lot of men actually do get active surveillance now and radical prostatectomy has actually gone down by six percent per year and so as a result of that we do have now formal fellowship brachytherapy programs uh, accredited by Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, and these programs are opening across the country. So very different picture than in the United States. So most of you here are surgeons. I'm just gonna give you Radiation Oncology 101 and, and kind of explain a little bit why brachytherapy, what's so magical about this. Well, there is no radio-resistant tumors. So that's number one. Number two, you fail to cure the cancer because you don't give adequate dose and you probably don't do that because of the normal tissue surrounding the tumor. And the other one, you miss the tumor. So there's geographical miss. So that's very simple. So when you look at the surgery, surgery is great because it actually eliminates the bulk, but surgery is not very good for microscopic disease. So therefore there's this geographical miss. External beam radiation is completely the opposite. It's actually very good for microscopic disease, but it really doesn't give it adequate dose to cure the local tumor. Brachytherapy by, by itself, like monotherapy, actually eliminates the bulk and also has the potential for geographical miss, just like surgery. So brachytherapy is actually very similar to surgery. So what happens then when you combine brachytherapy and external beam? Well, you have an advantage of both. You give adequate dose to treat the local disease and you also cover the microscopic disease. And that's where the royal flush starts. And for you who are not believing that local control is important, just take a look at this 2020 article and patients with Gleason score nine to 10, 900 of them from six randomized controlled trials. And what the authors actually show is that local failure predicts for worse overall survival, prostate cancer specific survival, and it actually they demonstrate really nicely that uncontrolled local disease actually gives rise to second wave of metastatic disease. But that happens five, six years down the road, not immediately. So let's just look at the excellent long-term outcomes. So there's three randomized trials. The graphs are here. 
the, uh, they compare external beam radiation versus external beam radiation plus brachytherapy boost, and some patients do get hormones as well. And all of these trials did show that PSA recurrence-free survival difference is about 25 to 30 percent. And Dave Crawford actually talked about his PSA definition and whatnot, and, and he said, like, okay, you have this astro definition or phoenix definition, but I'm going to show you here, this is a surgical definition of failure. And if you look at a send RT data and the surgical definition of failure is applied, you can drive the truck through these curves. So in summary, randomized controlled trials do show that prostate brachytherapy therapy increased PSA recurrence-free survival. There is no survival benefit as per these trials and no benefit to METS-free survival simply because the trials were really small and they were not actually powered to, to show any difference. Now, when we look at a little bit more, perhaps more significant outcomes, which is prostate cancer-specific mortality, um, so the randomized data, again, from TROG trial does show that if you use brachytherapy, HDR, and 18 months of hormones, the absolute difference here is 40%, 40% if you add brachytherapy boost. And then there is a beautiful study from, uh, again, Kishan in JAMA of 2018, where he looked at Gleason grade 5 multi-institutional patients about 2,000 of them closely, and these are results related to radical prostatectomy versus external beam versus external beam plus brachytherapy boost. And you see here, METS free survival boost is on the top. So if you do the boost, you actually really significantly improve the METS free survival, and absolute difference is about 30%. So here is the conclusion. So if you use the boost, you have better prostate cancer, cancer specific mortality, and absolute difference is about 30 to 40 percent. So that's quite significant. And then there's a lot of people who believe in brachytherapy, so they started to mine various databases around the you know, world and the globe. And so there's a lot of studies from a national cancer database in the US, and then there's the Swedish da da national database. They all show the same results. And so basically, here are some curves, but basically, patients who do get brachytherapy, and we are talking here about high-risk prostate cancer, have better overall survival, about 6 to 14 percent, and the follow-up is up to 12 years. And you're going to say, well, that could be biased. And I'm going to say, yes, I agree with you, that could be biased. So we use also less ADT. And so I'm just going to show you briefly, American Brachytherapy Society published systematic literature review on um, ADT use with prostate brachytherapy. And we looked at 52 studies and 43,000 patients, and over 5,000 patients were in high-risk category. And there was absolutely no survival benefit to adding ADT to brachytherapy in any risk groups. And in high-risk prostate cancer, only three out of six studies actually show increase in uh, PSA recurrence-free survival and cause specific survival with triple therapy. So the conclusion was that you know ADT actually is not particularly helpful when you when you add brachytherapy boost, and this is very different from external beam radiation alone. And there is also a very interesting uh, recent JAMA article, 2022, when they look at almost 3,000 patients and they pull them out from randomized controlled trials. And they look at something that is called the minimum threshold for optimal effect of ADT. So they look at actually duration of ADT. And for external beam, that duration of ADT that is necessary is minimum 26 months. And there is overall survival benefit, and that's for external beam alone. When you add brachytherapy boost, the minimum threshold is 12 months, so far less, and there's actually no overall survival benefit. Okay, so low downstream toxicity. So some people think the brachytherapy is quite toxic, and so here is the results from the randomized trial. You see the stricture rate is 8 to 13 percent, and so uh, a lot of attention has been paid to this uh, particular detail, and I absolutely agree. And so, well, here is the surgical data. And so from all your, you know, randomized controlled trials, grade 3 toxicity is 70 to 60 percent. And you're going to say, you yeah, have 28 seconds, and you're going to say, well, these are trials done 20 years ago, and I'm going to say exactly. This is exactly what brachytherapy trials are showing. Like, we learn. We are very similar to surgery. So we learn, as you're learning how to do better prostatectomy, we are learning how to do better brachytherapy. 
So the modern brachytherapy, the toxicity is actually many, minimal. And these are results from our institution in the post ascend RT era. So we have strictures 3% and GU grade 3 toxicity is 3%. So uh, with this excellent PSA outcomes, we really prevent downstream toxicity. So what downstream toxicity am I actually talking about? Well, here it is. It is enormous. It is enormous. And once the patient failed, they kind of move into different silos. So we never really kind of look at the toxicity between those who never had failure versus those who actually had failure. But we did that for SendRT patients. This is just publication submitted to Red Journal, 10-year follow-up. And 644 versus 468 prescriptions for chemo and ADT in external beam versus boost arm. Lastly, we actually save a lot of money by doing this. So Markov model was applied to ascend RT patients. Um, and so what they find is that with wide range of toxicity and utility assumptions, we save about $50,000 per patient using brachytherapy. And so this is mostly related to downstream, uh, decreased downstream cost. And so this is just a brief uh, story. Um, there's two men, they're both in their 90s, okay? They both die at the age of, let's say, 92. I don't know exactly, this is a true story. I don't know exactly the, the age when they died. One was actually the father of Peter Grimm, and Peter Grimm is one of the fathers of modern brachytherapy. Peter's dad, in his early 70s, got prostate cancer, and he got brachytherapy and he was well until he died when he was 90. His very best friend also was diagnosed with prostate cancer in his early 70s. This man had radical prostatectomy, which failed. Then he had salvage radiation, which failed. Then he had a loads of different systemic treatments, and he traveled around the world to you know, find what would be acceptable. And at the end of the day, they both died when they were in their early, early 90s, except that friend, his dad friends, spend from insurance money and his own pocket about $2 million. This is the difference we are talking about. And so I'm just going to close this saying with my favorite uh, insert from T.S. Eliot, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge and where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Thank you.